Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to episode 3 of the Mind Heist podcast. Uh, this episode, me and Amin spoke about Muslim entrepreneurship, uh, how to be a good Muslim making money, what's the best way to start, and, you know, different paths in life in terms of how to create an income. Enjoy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to episode 3 of the Mind Heist podcast with Muhammad, also known as my brother tweet <laughs> and myself i mean also known as i mean from sira masters <laughs> um brilliant yeah thanks everyone for listening to previous two episodes um what do you think so far muhammad i think it's been very very good i think we've had some great feedback people that are like there's people listening that i just didn't even imagine listening and we've got like I mean, to, to, to go over the week for a bit, we've had a lot of like uh, buzz on my Twitter, at least. Uh, I don't know how sn- your Snapchat's going. Uh, mm. We also got like, um, uh, I got an interview done for, yeah. like, for us based on someone who'd listened to this podcast. Uh, he's writing a book. He was uh, previously a reporter and he does uh, um, productions for Vice. Yeah. So he's done uh, an interview with, with us, or well, at least with me, um, regarding the content that we spoke about in the past two episodes which is like social media and muslims and that whole phenomenon so uh that might be out in and around april time wallahu alam but when that does come out it would be interesting to have a look through that yeah very good stuff man um i think i got i got a few followers i got a few people suggesting stuff i think and we got the email as well uh so the email is mind heist podcast at gmail.com if you want to send suggestions or questions or ideas or uh yeah so uh let's get into this topic man to this this week's topic inshallah which is which is drum roll please (laughs) how do i make the the effects with our mouth okay (laughs) you tell me what the topic is i mean because we jumped on this topic at a flip of a coin maybe five minutes ago yeah so the topic is, the topic is, I, I'm actually freestyling this. Um, the topic is um, entrepreneurship as a Muslim. How does that sound? Dun, dun, dun. It's just a bit sounds, plain. Sounds way above my pay grade. I'll tell you that. No problem, inshallah. So firstly, let's let's get into the, the, the business or the experience in business that you have tip, dipping your toes in. No, then, then I'll explain. So go ahead, you, you first. Well, surprise, surprise. What is the only business I've started? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe, uh, maybe your dad also has experience. I don't know, like that, anything like that. I don't know. Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, I've mentioned it twice before. I uh, started Pure Excite in 2014, which is like a clothing brand uh, with a mission mainly to, to uh, challenge the status quo of the Muslim fashion scene. Uh, I'd like to think that I succeeded, but I also was unable to continue it this year based on like personal, personal life changes and things like that. Uh, so it's sort of sitting there gathering dust, but you never know, inshallah in the future, it'll come back. Uh, we can go into more detail with that. Yeah. Uh, as far as anybody else. Mm, I think like a, a lot of my family members like I've owned restaurants so it's all restaurant stuff so they work for themselves that way uh other than that I haven't had too much experience okay okay yeah I would say you you did achieve that definitely uh you definitely caused uh people to step the levels up or at least see where the levels could be so mm-hmm. inshallah we'll get into that anyway so that's that's uh you Muhammad um as for myself so you could say I've been self-employed for the last two years. Yeah. Um, last two years. So currently I've got uh, one main business that I focus on, which is a consultancy. And the other is an e-commerce uh, brand, which you may have heard of. Um, but that's that's kind of a secondary thing right now. Um, as for before that, I mean... I've been working on on that the the one that's kind of a smaller thing for me for about three years. Oh yeah, before that I forgot that I did the whole T-shirt thing the same time as you, Muhammad. <laughs> I forgot about oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah. Tribe wear, baby. 
yeah, so I had a, I did a t-shirt brand called Tribe, and it was kind of taking influences from different uh, cultures and then adding that to streetwear, you know, normal uh, t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that. That was fun. That was probably my first, uh, my first real commitment to, you know, investing money into something and seeing how, what I could do with it. So that was a good experience. Um, yeah. But then since then, I've moved on from that and now, uh, you know, doing some bigger scale stuff, I suppose. Of course. Um, so uh, I don't know, Mohammed. like, how did it start for you? Like, what, did, where, like, it seems to me, yeah, this is my assumption. You did Pure XI. You started that because you just had to express yourself in a design kind of way. Or mm. was it like, you had an entrepreneurial thing that you wanted to express as well. Um, I'm trying to think back. <clears throat> I still remember what the, how the day went. I just don't remember the reason why I did it. Because I was, uh, I went to Juma and I uh, was sitting there, and I think maybe the khutbah was something to do with like people who just need to step up and 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 start sort right. of being proactive about making a living. Right. But I wouldn't say I started Pure Excite because I was trying to make a living. I did it because it was more of a passion project. Uh, so I just thought it kind of it kind of clicked in my head. I was like, "Oh my god, surely it can be really easy doing this. Mm-hmm. Why don't I just take a stab at it?" Because yeah, I was influenced by a lot of people that were doing it. Like I could see this brand was making this brand was doing up and this brand was doing whatever. So I thought, "Oh, I can take a stab at that. How hard can it be?" And I've had yeah. some experience. And I've got some ideas. So in like a week, I cobbled together some weird name and a domain and uh, some designs and sent that off. And the first batch and the first name I had was awful. Like the name of my initial company was Arabhood. Like how classically boring <laughs> can you get? Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> that's proper cheese here. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think I'd like to say that that's where a lot of people get stuck. They'll stay there. They'll yeah. stay with their first name and they won't, they don't want to change their baby, so to speak. Yeah. But I've changed my name like three times and yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. But um, yeah, so the first batch of stuff I did, my initial goal was to sell, uh, like some some brands do this thing where they sell by demand. So you get your orders in, once the orders are all in, then you start producing and then yeah. you sell. Yeah, so pre-order. What, yeah, something like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, when I did that, I'd made some, uh, a small amount just for like model purposes. I did the modeling, did some photos in that, put it up li- uh, put it online. And then I was like, okay, now I've just got to wait for like some orders to come in. And I'm going to be like, I think I'm going to be 100% real in this because I think people deserve the raw, uncut experience. Yeah, that's what will set us apart, yeah, inshallah. Everyone thinks it's easy, I guess. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I need to make at least 10, 10 minimum orders for the guy who makes the t-shirts or whatever to actually do it, you know? Yeah. So I'm like waiting, waiting, and waiting for these orders to come in, and I don't think I got, I didn't get any orders, bro. Like no pre-orders whatsoever. Yeah, okay. I was like, wow, like this isn't as easy as you think, because <laughs> you just think it's it's like the same thing with any content, whether it's YouTube, whether it's a business, whether anything you put out on the internet for people, you just sit there waiting, waiting for the next person to click, mm. you know. But it doesn't really work like that. So yeah. I thought, okay, uh, do I quit or do I carry on? Uh, no, I'll carry on. I'll just sell the ones I made for modeling purposes as actual products. Yeah. You know? So I did that. And then they started selling. Mm. But it was very strange. Like, people were just buying in bulk and buying. So I was like, okay, sweet. Anywho, long story short. Wait, wait. Um, let, one second. So on. ten, those 10 first t-shirts, they must have cost you, what, £150? I think, no, because it was a combination of t-shirts and jumpers. Right. Uh, so I had one t-shirt and one jumper, but maybe 10 altogether or 20 altogether. I don't recall. Yeah. Uh, I do remember it costing like 200 pounds to make yeah. however many I'd made at the time. So very small uh, first investment. Dude, every, I, and I think most of my investments were small Yeah. because I was, it's such a, at the beginning, I believe it's so dangerous to make a misstep, you know, like in pure xi down the line yeah every t-shirt was a hit but then one time like that one t-shirt that wasn't a hit would set you back so much yeah because you're just because, sitting on the stock yeah and because you're not you're not big enough to take a loss <laughs> yeah you 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 take a loss like that and and it's and surprisingly it was something i really believed in like there was a a white t-shirt 
uh, it was a Subaru t-shirt, and I loved the design. I thought this is sick. This is amazing. Yeah. But I don't think people got it because it came off the back of very complicated designs I'd made, which were very eye-catching. Yeah. I decided to do something just a little bit simpler because I just thought, hey, that's that's really nice. But simpler to to maybe the customers that I'd built up meant cheaper and it meant not as great and i'd rather spend mm. my money on the more complicated complex stuff okay so that set me back a while but um yeah it's it's, it's just very volatile industry bro yeah just, so see so you like basically yeah, that's basically that is what we've noticed between the two of us the main difference between muhammad and i is that Muhammad's very spontaneous and i'm very like methodical isn't it mm. um, oh yeah so that shows in in the way you started it you you just you kind of just went with it you had a name later you realized it wasn't such a good name you changed it etc mm. um and uh i think me myself i don't remember too much about when i started the tribe but it must have been much more planned out um um yeah uh, so just to to go into you 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 started that way i must have started i remember when i was in school <laughs> i was like 15 I was like selling sweets out of my locker, that kind of thing. Oh, then you were that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then later on, uh, I remember the iPhone uh, must have been maybe iPhone 4 or 4S. Um, it dropped in the UK. It used to drop in certain countries first, isn't it? Then yeah. it would be released in the UAE where I was, uh, maybe three months to six months later. So what I did was I used to buy iPhones when they dropped in the UK and then sell them here. Um, so oh, wow. I, I did that stuff a few times. Um, that was the first thing. Uh, then only later, uh, I, I started tribe as like my first thing with proper investment. And the difference between, um, my brand and yours was that your first design was a hit and that gave you the capital to reinvest. Whereas mine, I, I can't remember if the first one was okay or not, but eventually I had some designs that were just weren't selling, which means you invest whatever, 500 pound in a design, it doesn't mm. sell, which means 500, it's not lost per se, but it's not usable because it's sitting yeah. in the stock. Yeah. So, so what, yeah. What was, what you, what was your idea of my first design that was a hit? Because as far as I remember, my first design were yeah. a hit. Uh, wasn't it the, it was that hub one, no? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 it was, it was Maktoub, Maktoub. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. We're yeah, that, that was popular, yeah. Yeah, that was popular. Okay, yeah, we're yeah. on the same page. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, uh, I, I went uh, along with that. Basically, during that period of starting the, the brand, I was doing a lot of reading and a lot of reading business books. So I'm learning, I'm here, I'm learning, I'm learning, and I'm actually applying. And I think that that was a huge breakthrough for me, even though, you know, I wouldn't consider that brand as like a financial success at all. But mm. the fact that I was implementing, it's kind of like... Uh, I remember what's his name? Uh, Tim Ferriss. He's a, he's an angel investor. So he said he was considering doing an MBA at some point. Yeah. Masters in business administration. Now in the U S those things cost like a hundred thousand dollars plus. Yeah? yeah. Um, so he was considering doing that. And then he thought it, because he wanted to be good at business, he thought the MBA will teach you business, which it doesn't really. Yeah. So yeah. he's like, instead, why don't I take this hundred thousand dollars and invest? myself invest it in uh companies myself and i'll consider that as a tuition fee so i'll learn through investing the money in a very practical way instead of going to university and yeah. so that's kind of my version of that was doing this t-shirt brand i'm reading stuff i'm investing the money i'm managing the money i'm managing the stock and all that stuff and trying to sell of course um and so that that's what i would consider it was like my little uh tuition fee thing uh, of how to get my my feet in the game oh, man. and uh i think without doing that that which ended up me just shutting it down because i don't know i guess uh it's, it was the ratio of effort to sales was not good yeah. enough yeah yeah um even though i shut it down i don't know if, if if i had not done that i don't know if i'd been able to have the confidence really to do what i'm doing now so yeah so yeah, I think like starting on a base is uh, very beneficial mm -hmm. because I had I don't know how many I can't remember how many followers I had on Instagram, but my personal Instagram account I switched it into the business one. Mm. So like I force fed people pure XI, 
yeah, <laughs> just yeah. to just to sort of uh, test the waters. Um, but what I'd like to do, actually, what we should talk about is mm. um, there's a lot of people who may be listening uh, that are interested in starting something themselves. Yes, and I've got thousands of emails. Well, thousands is an exaggeration, but hundreds of emails. Like, oh, I want to do this. How do I start? I want to do this. How do I start? Okay. I think it's it's a, maybe a good discussion to have, like, just clear cut. Okay, you've had the idea of this is, you know, X, I want to sell this item. Mm. How do I go about it? Yeah. Um, do you want to elaborate on maybe how you start? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it's pretty tough. Uh, so the first thing I would say is if you're thinking of starting a business, I would say get a job or if you have a job, try and increase your salary. Okay, so basically you want to be in a position where even if you're where you can basically keep your business afloat for as long as possible, because most businesses will close in the first year and that's because of cash problems. Right. Um, and so if you can, if let, let's just give a real example here. Yeah. Let's say you make four thousand pounds a month. Yeah. You can live on three thousand and every month you're willing to invest a thousand pounds into your business right? If you can do that and you're in that stable position, then uh, your, your, your business is going to survive. And a lot of the times, it, t- it just come, it comes to a tipping point, basically. Uh, after a year, after two years, whatever, of y- you're fine. You're not struggling financially in, a per- in your personal life. Your business is surviving because you, you're able to put money into it when it needs it, yeah? Um, and if you just keep the go- that going, obviously with a few other ingredients, important ingredients, you, you're much more likely to survive. But what a lot of people think you have to do is, you know, quit my job, do this full time. I think personally, most of the time when I see people doing that, it's uh, it's kind of a, what's the word? It's like an, a bit of an excuse, right? Well, they're so prone to burning out, no? Uh, burning out. Well, yeah, like, like in the sense where you're going to get, there's too much pressure to make money from day one, firstly. And secondly, uh, yeah, like all that stability is not there. Uh, yeah. And then even if it's your first business, that's crazy as well, because you're most likely your first business is not going to do that well. And like, you know what I mean? So uh, it's better. Like people think business is all about risk and taking risks. And I disagree completely. Uh, the people that are good at business, they're good at, you know, decreasing your risk and lowering your, finding ways to lower your risk, you know. So yeah. uh, uh, let me try and give an example of lowering your risk. Um, la- I mean, I already mentioned one, which is keeping your job and having a set amount that you put in, in the business every every month or whatever. Um, yeah. Another way, another way would be that let's say you want to sell um, coconut water. Yeah, you want to sell yeah. coconut water. You go to the supplier and you say, "Look, um, I've got this." You, you you try and impress them. Yeah, so you say. I want to buy, uh, I'm, I've got this brand and you show them your branding, yeah? Like do your own branding, just a quick thing that looks pretty good and decent and show them that you're serious and then say, look, I've got this plan to do this, this, this. And eventually I'm planning on ordering 3000 units a, a month from you. Okay. Now to them, that might sound good. And so then you say, uh, yeah, all I need is I need to pay you in 60 days, not now. I need, I need you to give me a, a kind of a credit extension thing. Yeah, if you've impressed them enough, they believe in you, then uh, they might give it to you, and then boom, now your your risk is lowered automatically. Yeah, so these mm-hmm. are type of like strategies that good business people do to always lower their risk, lower their risk, lower their risk. Even uh, like VCs, venture capitalists, they're like the type of people that will put a hundred thousand dollars of their money into something like I don't know Snapchat when it was young, when it was brand new. The, the guy pitched to them, said, this is my idea. They give 10 people, give him a hundred thousand dollars. He got a million dollars to try and build this into a real business. Even those people who are professional, like investors, that's what they do for a full time living. Even them, they spread their money amongst many companies, right? So again, they're lo- always looking to minimize their risk as well. And they know they do it in a way where they believe that out of 10 companies they invest in, only one will make it big, but it will make it so big that the nine that, that failed won't even matter. Hmm. That's so it's crazy, I guess. I mean, I mean, like, I think a lot of uh, people need to also establish their why and why they'd want to do something because, yeah, like, 
my uh, I think my, the, that's one thing I struggled in a lot when I started Pure XI is because it really come out of a hobby and a passion mm-hmm. it was difficult for me to uh, nail down my goal and what my goal was with right. it right. Um, so when it came to money I wasn't very good with money in the sense that I didn't really mind <laughs> I, I wasn't very sharp and stern on myself or how I practiced like someone would maybe want a discount or something and my uh my my what's the word my good muslim would come out <laughs> instead of my business mind would come out you know because i wasn't really thinking about that yeah or when like some emergency would happen in the family i wouldn't think twice about taking money out of pure excited to help whoever i needed to help you know okay uh, and this is before like i as like i'd registered pure excited as a business that's mm. a whole different kettle of fish but um what I think is good when you start off is to list down like what you're good at, what your resources are Mm -hmm. and what you're not good at and what you need help with. Yeah. Uh, Like, okay, I was great at designing and I was great at marketing. I'd I'd like to think anyway, but I was terrible with money, like to keep track of money incomings and outgoings. I just couldn't really set my mind to do it. And like, so, so that was like my biggest weakness. And I think uh, I, maybe because of the locale or maybe because of who was around me at the time, I didn't have anyone that I felt comfortable bringing on board to do that. Okay. You know? Uh, so would you think about like uh, work, like teaming up with people? Would you think, do you think it's possible to do everything on your own? Because I did everything on my own for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and I, I did burn myself out doing that, but I always feel like it would have been great to have someone maybe like-minded that I could have worked with. Yeah. So, um, so I did Tribe on my own completely. And then my two current businesses, uh, I have partners with those, yeah? So what I would say is your first business, I would say it might be best to do that on your own. Mm. Um, and really see it as, like I said before, like your own education in business, experiment, and uh, really learn every aspect of the business at least a little bit, okay? Because when it comes to bringing people on, whether it's a partner or, or an employee, um, you need to be able to judge if they're good at it in the first place, right? So if mm-hmm. you don't know a little bit about it, you won't be able to judge if they're good or not. And uh, secondly, it's not a question of, are you going to have other people on board? It's when, right? Because if you're doing it on your own, and inshallah it does very well, no doubt you're going to have to employ people because you're going to run out of time and you're going to run out of expertise. You know, if you want to take the business to a next level, you need people with next level skills. So, um, so a lot of the time it's, if you're doing it on your own, it's a matter of balancing the time you have to put into it with the money coming in because you need a certain amount of money coming in. So then you can hire people, isn't it? And Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that's what I would say about that in terms of partners. I mean, you know, you can get partners who have, for example, yeah. I'm not a sales kind of guy, you know, the kind of guy that will call people every week, uh, the same guy every week trying to get an answer out of them, whether they're interested in the service or not. Yeah. I, I don't really like phone calls, etc. but I have a partner who breathes that. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm sitting here now thinking, cause that, that business I'm talking about is about a year old now. Um, I'm thinking there is no way I would be here without him, you know, because he's just simply doing something that I just can't even do even a little bit. Like I can't, even reach 10% of the way he does it, yeah? And likewise, I'd like to think it's vice versa, you know? I, I do things that he doesn't feel he could do. So it works. But the the other thing you have to consider is is like the values and the way you work. And, you know, if, if this person's really committed to the business, all that kind of stuff. So that's something to consider, you know, stuff like, are they putting money into it? Do they have something to lose? Because a lot of the time, if they don't have anything to lose, they're not really going to help you. They're going to feel like, you know, oh, well, you know, I like it, it's it's human, isn't it? It's, it's normal. Yeah, but. I feel like there's always like a conflict. If, if it's a business you've started yourself, mm. it's always a conflict like you're not working as hard as I am because I care yeah. about this business and you just care yeah. about the, the, the money at the end of it. And I've had sort of stuff like that within a few people that I've worked with because no doubt I was very very proud of pure xi and very like it was like my baby you know yeah and and then i also there was conflict in myself because if when when i'll give you an example 
the time that I don't know if you remember, I made a black sweatshirt uh, paradise one. Yeah, uh, it did very well at the time when uh, I when that was like in the in the kitchen, so to speak. I was working with someone. Yeah, uh, and he suggested, listen, you need to do something black, something that people are going to wear uh, that isn't too loud. That do you know what I mean? That's right, yeah. easy to sort of look at. Yeah. I was like, no, man, I don't want to do that. Like that doesn't go, that isn't in my, do you know what I mean? That isn't in my design mind frame. I just yeah. want to do something loud and proud and whatever. Mm. Uh, and he sort of really pushed me to do something. I was like, okay, forget it. I'll, I'll put something together. I put that together yeah. and I reluctantly, reluctantly put it out there. Yeah. And it sold, at the time, it sold like wildfire, bro. Yeah. Like, I had to keep restocking. I'd never seen, I never expected anything like that. Like I was just every week or two, I was buying, I was like ordering more boxes of it. Like mm. I just had to keep going up to London as well and like doing this back and forth just to restock this constantly. Uh, yeah. And it was crazy. Like there's people, and it was the first time that I'd started getting people messaging me like, oh, uh, I've seen somebody in X town or Y town wearing your stuff I've seen yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. it was and then it was like oh my god this is awesome <laughs> yeah so yeah sometimes you do have to take advice reluctantly and you have to but you know it's it, it's difficult at a time and a stage where the risk of just failure is so you know it's so it's like hanging over your head yeah Be- because if you think about it uh let's say I spent 200 pound on a batch yeah then I don't know, the most I'd make out of that is I'd probably double, you know, like yeah. 400 to 450, you know? Yeah. So you make that and then you th- you get a bit confident. You're like, okay, next time I'm going to spend 300 on something else. Yeah. You know, you spend that 300, but suddenly that 300 is a selling and you've just taken a big, you know, big blow and mm. you might only have like 100 left in your your bank account yeah definitely you know what i mean it's 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 such a risky uh thing to do so this is why like over time things would sell out very quickly because i was so like i was just nibbling at the stock do you know what i mean like i didn't want to order too much because yeah. i was so scared to take that risk yeah and then you you, so you said that that design the black one hmm. that basically came from someone outside of yourself and so that's like the value of having someone at least to advise you and stuff Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt. Um, yeah. That was, you know, that was because you, if you compare that to everything else that maybe came out later, it was way simpler. Like it was, but but then you know, I turned that into like a theme that, that I placed that design onto t-shirts and onto hats, you know, because it became such a typical thing. And it's yeah. also another thing like once a customer buys, then that customer has bought that one product. And that customer now wants something new. Yeah. And then you feel obliged to make something new, forgetting that there's millions and millions of other customers that still haven't bought that first product yet. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I always had this thing in my head when some, like every time someone would buy, they'd always message like a week later, oh, when's something new coming out? Do you know what I mean? Why do you make something new? Yeah. And then in your head, you perceive that as, oh, the people want something new. Mm. Forgetting that actually you can let them wait a bit because there's still th- so many people that haven't bought item number one yet. Yeah, and maybe you should try and market it to those. True. And that's maybe a mistake I made. I, I think I, I moved on to making new things too quickly mm. when I hadn't really squeezed the the lemon, so to speak, of the current market. Yeah, yeah. I think the same. Yeah, I had a similar experience actually in the the e-commerce business that I've got. We had like one main product and we kept selling hundreds and hundreds of them. And I was thinking, like, uh, it's funny because I was thinking, who's even buying this? Why is it so popular? I didn't fully understand why it was doing it. I just knew it was doing it, you know. Um, And every time I thought, okay, enough people have seen this ad, like everyone has seen this ad that I've been selling it through. Um, You know, surely like we really need new products, like hurry up guys, you know. But like again, it kept selling and selling and selling. So uh, that's a lesson to take. Actually, is like n- never assume that uh, your your customers are like you. You know, you can't you can't build a business based on what you like because yeah. you're, you're not the customer in the end. You know, um, unless of course, I mean, you know, some people they say start a business fixing a problem you have. Yeah. And that's that's cool as long as there there is a certain group of people that feels the same way 
as you about this problem. But if yeah. you're if you're like a very, you know, specific kind of person, you're very individual and unique, that's not going to serve you well, you know. So, uh, so yeah, bro, I just wanted to go back a bit to starting a business. How do you start it and all of that? Here's a very practical way and I'll give you a real life case study. So Sarah Masters, yeah, my uh, blog slash YouTube channel. Um, I, I, I've read loads of books about productivity and I think I cracked the code, right? For when it comes to productivity, you know, at least, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable in what I know and I've applied it and it works. Okay. So yeah. I have a few people on my email list and I thought, you know, maybe they'd be interested in getting something really practical on showing them how to do that. So before I made anything, yeah, before I made any videos showing them how to do it or anything like that, I emailed them and I said, I'm looking to, you know, I want to teach you X, Y, Z, like the main benefit of the course. Uh, would you be interested? Yeah. And then out of those people, I can't remember the numbers, but let's say 20 people replied saying yes. Okay. Out of those 20 people, I said, okay, great. Here is the exact thing that the product will include. Are you still interested? Let's say out of 20, 10 said, yeah, I'm still interested. Out of those 10, and me, keep in mind, yeah, I've not spent one pound yet. I've not spent a penny. I'm just yeah. validating the idea first, yeah? So out, let's say 10 people, they say, yeah, I'm still interested. I sent them a PayPal link there and then. And maybe some of those people that, that paid for this, uh, they're, they're listening to this, yeah? Uh, I sent them a PayPal link. I said, look, if you want it, here it is, buy it, yeah? And then they bought it, and then I made it. Okay, so I think people get caught up a lot in, oh, let me get the domain, let me get the website, oh, the branding has to look amazing, oh, the logo, oh, this. No, just you can you can validate the idea first through something as simple as emailing your personal contacts, your friends, uh, asking them to pass it on to people. Would you buy this? Would you buy this? Validate your idea through money rather than opinions, because you know very well, Muhammad, that People will tell you, oh, I'd like that design t-shirt. And then when you release it, they won't buy it. Hmm. Money, they, they got to put the money where the mouth is, you know. Uh, yeah. So uh, I would say that is what I would really encourage you to do. Think of your idea. Your idea might be amazing or it might be rubbish. It might be just something you would like and 10 other people in the whole world. Or it might be something thousands of people would, would pay good money for. The only way you can separate those two things because in your head, they might sound sick, but the only way to separate the two is to go out there and sell to people. And, and people are scared of asking for money and selling. And that's why most people, they'll spend months designing a product and then it doesn't sell and they're wondering why. And unfortunately, most businesses are like this. They, they spend months on the product and the website and it looks all clean and polished and everything. And then they realize, actually, no one really wants this product. And so um, if you validate it the way I just described, um, for, put the numbers aside, yeah? Whether just just see if you can get some paying customers without any fancy logos or anything. Because the truth is, if your product solves a real uh, problem, then people will pay you even if you don't have a fancy website. A few people will pay you. And then with that money that they pay you with, you can invest that and you can polish things up. So that's something really practical, I would say. Do you think? Well, I want to actually uh, like take this 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 uh, idea to is uh, yeah Muslim customers and Muslim businesses. Okay. So customers that are buying, I don't know, is Muslim themed content and sellers that are selling to that market as well. Yeah. Do you think that because this is something like I noticed a very big difference between the average Muslim customer and the average non-Muslim customer okay. in terms of, I don't know, this is just their idea, like in terms of their willingness to spend money or their willingness to support or yeah. their willingness to, do you think that there's some, there's something, some conversation to be had there about the nature of how Muslims spend money? Because yeah. from what I've learned, what I've seen, it's, uh, I feel like uh, something that we spoke about in a, maybe one or two episodes before mm. about how, um, we are very quick to dismiss something new and and very quick to point fingers and shame it as opposed to support it. Yeah. Any sort of new initiative. So uh, things get laughed at very quickly and 
there's always like I don't know I guess a, a, an under like an underlying rumbling of like negativity around anyone trying to do something different. Yeah. You know, until it really succeeds. Yeah. And maybe that's when the the Muslim community jumps on the bandwagon. But from what I've seen, it's like every Muslim that wants to buy stuff. Well, at the beginning, anyway, it was like desperate for a discount. Mm. Like, you know, it was like, oh, have we got a discount code? Or can you send me a free T-shirt? Um, it was it was very, very prevalent whilst... Yeah. I don't, I don't. I don't know. This is just an assumption. Well, it's like maybe in some non-Muslims that would message or would purchase, it would just be like a clean-cut transaction. You know. Yeah. There, w- there wouldn't be any haggling involved. It wouldn't be necessary. Yeah. So, well, Adam, do you, do you think you have any experience in terms of difference between? Yeah. Muslims and not. Um, there are a few things popping into my head right now. So, the first is that, um, Muslims are actually a very tight-knit community in the sense that their core values are very similar to each other and that makes things very tight, yeah? And we're like a, we're like a family, you know? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً You know? And really, when you look at it from a marketing perspective, you see that in the buying behaviors of Muslims, yeah? And what, what you're talking about in terms of discounts and stuff like that. Let me give you an example. So imagine you're in a very tribal society, Okay, yeah. where everyone knows their tribe and everyone identifies with the tribe and all that. Yeah. Now, uh, there are some tribes which are more powerful than others. Yeah. And more respected or whatever. Now, imagine a policeman from a lower tribe, if you like, stops a guy from a powerful tribe and he says, you are speeding. Yeah. Well, actually, he stops him because yeah, he's speeding. The guy gets out of his car and then the policeman goes to him and he says, uh, he recognizes him. He knows he's from that tribe. You think he's going to say you were speeding. He might mm. hesitate. He might be like, oh, right. Because it's so tight. Because there's like these, these tribes, they're living together. They know each other. There's reputation. There's this. The guy's going to, the policeman, he might hesitate. He'd be like, oh, right. Sorry. Uh, it was a mistake. You know, please go on, sir. Yeah, that kind of thing. Because it's tight. Okay. So you're saying that non-Muslims wouldn't ask you for a discount, but Muslims would. It's because they feel close to you. They feel like you're their family. This is what I just popped into my head. And really, yeah, it makes yeah. a lot of sense for me. So th- I think the tighter knitter community, the more you'll find that they ask for discounts or they, uh, they, they might feel jealous as well, or they might support even more, etc. Right. We, we see all of these dynamics, I think, happening, uh, in, in the Muslim, uh, community, you know, when it comes to buying and selling. Um, on the flip side, though, so th- there are definitely those common traits, I think, among Muslims that brings us very t- together f- uh, like that. But on the flip side, I think most problems that uh, things that we point to, uh, I think uh, other other people have them as well. Most of the time you find it. Uh, but but when you I don't know, but people are critical of their own people a lot of the time, you know, so that's why we talk about it a lot. But yeah, there are some things I would say. Um, also, I've. So I've got experience with this because I know people, for example, from, you know, Muslim Entrepreneur Network, from uh, people that have been selling in the Muslim market and my e-commerce business sells in the Muslim market. I don't know. I don't know why I'm hiding it, but I might reveal the name down the line. Yeah, because people probably heard of it. You have um, to plug it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, people have these people like that I've spoken to about the thing. They mention a few things about specific to the Muslim market. And one is that the Muslim market is still a bit old school in the sense where if there's a celebrity endorsement, if the title Sheikh is added to a product, if the, there's, it's been on TV, yeah, Muslims yeah. are more likely to support that thing, right? So Muslims, I, this is what I've been told and it does make sense. Muslims want a more polished thing. They, they, it's, it's basically that old school thinking of, Oh, the celebrity said it's sick, so it is sick, and it's been on TV, and this and that. Whereas uh, in other areas of the world, maybe, or different people, it's it's become more, like, basically, selling has become democratized, right? So anyone can sell anything, and the more authentic you are, the more people might buy from you. But in the Muslim market, it might be different that they're looking for something very polished, very professional looking, and it's endorsed by XYZ person. Hmm. It's. I think like um, there, there's also like something to say about 
Muslim Muslims not just selling products but offering services. So I've spoken to a lot of uh, graphic designers. Yeah, that do work exclusively uh, exclusively for Muslims. Yeah, because I think the area of graphic design is can be quite difficult in terms of opening that up for uh, a non-Muslim clientele because mm. sometimes you're forced to work on something that maybe isn't 100% permissible or you're not comfortable with it. Anywho, so you'll get a lot of people like that want to make content and they have, um, you know, oh, make me this logo or design this video intro for me. Yeah. And uh, they will get a shock when the Muslim offering the service asks for like, the standard rate yeah <laughs> or which is which you know which is actually to be honest it isn't even the standard rate because if you go to anyone professional and ask them for a you know something like that some sort of media some sort of marketing tool or logo or whatever they will they will charge you like a phenomenal <laughs> amount of money yeah and uh, <laughs> I've just seen like the backlash of when when that happens when you like mm. let's say okay I want a logo yeah I don't know I'm just gonna throw a random number like five hundred pounds is what the man will charge yeah the the Muslim will go crazy bro mm. like he'll just be like how could you and we meant yeah and it goes back to what you're saying you know this is for the sake of Allah do you know what I mean and I was yeah. like yeah but the guy still has to put food on the table and this is his business and this is all he does yeah you know and I just feel like uh, I don't know I think it's very um, I suppose that there's this idea, isn't there, that most, like the communities anyway, not just Muslims, but communities should uh, pass the money around in their, like, yeah. to, to strengthen their communities. And I don't think that has really reached the uh, the internet culture or internet e-commerce businesses, you know, whether yeah. it's selling products online or whether it's uh, providing services. services. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think that's actually reached yet. Mm. Uh, because it, I, I'd say you know you, you've, that's that exists within like your butchers and your do you know what I mean like your halal yeah uh, businesses in real life like outside of the web but in terms of on on the web which is mainly what we're speaking about yeah uh, because I don't think have you ever run a shop like no in, not a physical no, shop no yeah so I've worked in shops but I've never ran one no um, so yeah I think we've got a lot to learn when it comes to something like that I think. Uh, and especially in a, in a in an age where because it's important to talk about I think in an age where everyone wants to create content and and do something online yeah uh, but they can't do it all on their own and they require services mm. it's 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 difficult I mean even uh, if I I don't even know if if this is an avenue we should go down because I haven't got any experience with it but even like um, when a a public speaker goes to an event and charges a certain amount of money right. There is there is this discussion that goes on because um, I'm of the opinion, and I, and I think it's a I think it's an Islamic opinion. I don't know, but like I'm of the opinion that an individual can charge for sharing knowledge, right? Because of you know travel and making it his life thing. Like this is what he does for a living. Mm. But then there's also this part of me that's like, well, how much is too much? Yeah, you know, true. because I've, I, you know, without naming names, because I don't even know the names, but I've heard ridiculous numbers, yeah. <laughs> like, and I've heard ridiculous requests and demands that maybe a speaker might have. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, it's, I think it's an interesting. I, it's a shame, maybe, that this stuff isn't out there. Mm. Obviously, it's their personal information. I wouldn't want that to to leak, but just to build an understanding, because the moment that does leak out. Yeah. It, it it becomes something like as if people were trying to hide mm. and then uh the idea of oh my god how can x person um charge so much for for for, for islamic knowledge or just a talk or something like that you yeah. know yeah it, and, and, and this is the thing like the within the arena of muslims because in our personal lives uh i don't think we've understood the concept of money yet in terms of religious muslims yeah. i feel like money is such a uh, taboo topic because yeah. it's either be charitable or live on nothing and that is the pious person yeah you know the pious person is the one who throws all his money into charity or he doesn't have any money and he's very poor and he's very humble mm. but then the moment there's a muslim with hey look at that guy with a nice car mm. or 
you know, he's got a nice watch on, or why is he wearing such an expensive suit? Mm. It becomes a topic of discussion, like, oh, how can he be? Is he? He can't be a good Muslim if he's like that, can he? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and I'd love to get into people's. And I know I don't know if this is linked to the topic, but it, it's part of it. I would love to get into people's heads that maybe it's best to assume that if someone has visibly this amount of money, yeah. let's say he has this watch, this car, this thing. I'd like to put in people's heads. Imagine how much else then he must have given to charity, or imagine how much else he's done good for. Yeah, right? good point. This 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 even goes like we can even take this to a stage. I don't want to get political, but a stage of countries. You know, when you hear about this country has this much wealth, yeah. look how much it's done. Well, yeah. okay, let's put let's frame it. If if the country has shown you twenty percent of its visible wealth, let's assume eighty percent of that is doing good things, yeah, because exactly. you don't know, you never know, and I, you know it could be anyone. So yeah, Husn then goes back to it, doesn't it? Like yeah. just having a good opinion of your Muslim brothers and sisters, yeah. like, and 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 it's difficult to uh, really think of that at the beginning because your gut reaction when you see someone a wealthy Muslim mm. is oh they are too wealthy for their own good if I <laughs> yeah. had that money yeah if I was a millionaire Muslim you, you'd see the world would be different yeah, but yeah. You, you just you know you I just think don't. let's do we could do a whole episode about money itself and finances yeah, yeah. inshallah so if you have any questions or comments about that topic email us inshallah mindheistpodcast at gmail.com um, bro about this whole f- freelancer and, and services kind of thing um like I, I sell services, right? That's my main business. I, I basically, I help businesses grow. Um, and as a service, I charge them for the service. Um, so I know about this and I've heard non-Muslims having the same issues of people trying to bargain them down too hard. Um, I think it's part of, it's part of the, the business itself of services is that you're able to communicate what value you bring, right? And so if you if you go to, you know, some Muslim organization, whatever, they want a logo, you say it's 500, they think it's crazy because they don't value it to the amount of 500 pounds, you know. And yeah. so either you need to communicate it to them that it's actually worth 500 pounds or which might be hard, right? Because it's still like maybe a lot of people have an old school thinking about it that, you know, branding's not worth much and blah, blah, blah yeah. Um, on the other hand, what you could do alternatively is only go to people who do value it already you know yeah. and that's kind of what we do is we don't if you're a brand new business uh, even if you might want to pay us for our services we generally won't work with you because we know it's going to be a strain on you and uh, we want to help like good businesses become great rather than help businesses exist and that's not because new businesses are bad it's because we just chose who we want to work with and we only work with those people and if they give us hassle about price usually it means they don't value they don't see the value and so i we can try and explain the value but if they're not convinced we we actually it will probably be a burden for us even to work with them as well so uh a new business Yeah. A new business might not even know how much these prices go for. Yeah, that's. I think that's another issue. Like you can't walk into the mall and buy a logo. Mm, that's you true. Know what I mean, you can't compare logos in a you know in a shop. Yeah, you you're a lot of people that ask for logos and ask for logo work done. Yeah, like a new customer. Let's say you you are a, a service provider yeah. and someone comes to you for the first time and you've never heard of them before. Yeah. Clearly, this may be their first ever project. They haven't got a clue what number they're going to get thrown at. Of course, Do you know what I mean. Yeah. So and I think that's where a lot of the initial shock comes from. Like, but then you know if you speak to someone who's more seasoned, then yeah. when you tell them, oh yeah, five hundred pound, yeah. they're like, yeah, okay, sweet. Yeah. Because they, they, they're they aware of the going prices and they're aware of how you know the, the market works. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. Actually, that's a very good point. And it just depends. It's like I said, it depends how much you value it because people will do a logo for you for £5 and people will do a logo for you for £50,000, you know. And mm-hmm. so you've got to decide what it's worth to you and then pay accordingly. You know, if you pay £5, you probably get £5 of value out of it. Uh, and you know the same the other way so um, I think you know if you're if you're having that trouble and you're a freelancer you've got to decide who you want to serve and um, and you've got to be good at explaining the value you bring and if you're having trouble with that you might want to change who you're trying to serve because I think if all these freelancers 
if if they kept getting these you know free sabilillah kind of things and they yeah. just said no i can't do that uh, i think eventually people would realize that actually these people are skilled they've got you know, mouths to feed and you know it's worth something and if they, well, you know, if they still don't value it, then they could they can go on to Microsoft Paint and they can make their own one. <laughs> yeah, true, <laughs> true. It like say a commitment. Like even now, a lot of these uh, programs that are used to to design and create content are yeah. not as uh, accessible as they were. Uh, maybe I don't know a decade ago. Mm. Now it's all like cloud based and subscription based. And mm. but this this does actually bring me into another idea: is um, when creating a business or when dealing with business. Yeah. How much of your religion and your ethics do you mm. allow in yeah. to the business? Because I, I've realized, like when I was doing Pure XI, maybe the mis- a lot of mistakes I made were because I was, I guess, I couldn't separate business from Islam in the sense that yeah, there is a lot of Deen that goes with business. Like there's a lot of guidelines yeah. with Deen that are specific to business. But there are also a lot of specific guidelines to a human being and how he conducts himself mm-hmm. that isn't always necessary within business. For example, I can be charitable in uh, in you know my personal life and with my personal wealth, yeah. but sometimes being too charitable with my uh, business yeah. means that it's not really a business anymore. Yeah, you know, it's more of you know I'm just giving handouts and and giving people freebies. Yeah, um, and not just that, but like just in in general, like conducting yourself as a Muslim businessman. What are like I mean, I think you've got more experience than me. What would you say are like your top tips? I suppose mm. of being you know bringing in um, you know your Islamic morals. Yeah, being a good person within the business environment. Yeah, I was going to ask ask you this actually and uh, before about you know how does business and Islam work together? Does it is it encouraged or not? But but okay, I'll just ask, answer what you said first. So, uh, but how how much does it come in? I think the first thing that I think of is like uh, Islam, Islam and business. The first kind of uh, uh, con- uh, what's it called? way of conducting yourself as a Muslim is not uh, not using music in your ads. The first thing I think of is integrity, like doing what you say you'll do and following contracts and agreements that you've you've put in place and sticking to your word. And I think, you know, you'll agree that a lot of Muslims have kind of uh, failed in that part. And that's like the first thing I think of. And that is the most oh, important yeah. thing. I call that I call that the inshallah culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that that's a huge deal for me. That's the most important. And it's, I, you know, I know a lot of Muslim entrepreneurs and I know that uh, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough always sticking to what you said you'll do, whether it, whether it comes to getting busy or whether it comes to six months after signing that contract, you don't really like the pricing anymore or whatever. Yeah, it's very tough. That's why uh, I, can't, I, I can't remember if it's in the hadith of the seven people under the shade of Allah or not. But it's, yeah, it is. The seven, one of the seven under the shade of Allah on Yom al will be the, the trader that is just, right? If I'm not mistaken. I better be right. You better be right. If you're misleading people, I mean, I'm kicking you off the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, yeah, there is a huge, huge uh, uh, reward for the trader or the, the person trading that, that is just, right? And who sticks to their word. So, because it's very hard to do. Um, so, that's the first thing I think of. And then later down, late, like after that, I think of obviously the guidelines we have in place in terms of, you know, what we put out there, what we don't put out there, paying zakah, all this stuff is, is very important. And it will only bring barakah into your business if you follow the guidelines, you know. Um, and uh, some uh, a, a speaker or he actually he teaches lessons. He's quite well known. He's also a businessman. And he said that someone he employed became a Muslim through him just like working with them i think it was a it was a woman it was work, she was working remotely he hired her and i can't remember it must it might have been just from him writing inshallah here and there maybe he sent her a bit of material but obviously it's how you conduct yourself how prof- professional you are that is going to impress them as well and yeah. you know after working with with his business she became muslim you know she wanted to become muslim so it's also like a very big uh play a way to do da'wah as well and we know that 
the Prophet Sallam. That's why you know Khadija wanted to work with him in in his business in business because he was trustworthy. That's why the the Quraysh gave him their money to store it, and that's why when he uh, you know gave the message to them that they had no reason to think he was lying because he was so trustworthy. You know, so the all these things will come into play, and it won't mean. I don't think that it means you can't be a super modern, super polished, super effective and professional business. It will actually only make you more like that uh, if you follow like Islamic guidelines. No doubt. I mean, I believe that um, this is also something that not only is it going to bring you barakah in your work and your money, mm. um, it also goes to people that aren't just working as an like trying to do their own business. It could go for people that work in nine to five anywhere. For sure, you know. And I, you know, I've recently just left uh, my previous employment, and if looking back on it, I was thinking, like, I, I mean, I was there for four years, so my first two years, I feel like, yeah, I worked like crazy, like really trying to establish that into my life. The yeah. whole work ethic of a Muslim and how you know be on time and and make sure that nine to five is all work and you're not just slacking. I think towards the end, yeah, I slacked a lot because I wasn't happy there anymore. Yeah, and um, I suppose you know I used to think that about myself. I used to think, oh, you know, Islamically this isn't right. What I'm doing isn't right, and then that would kick me up again, and I'd start trying to work hard again. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's difficult. It is difficult for anyone working in a job that they don't enjoy. It's difficult to uh, to to muster up the motivation um but i think for anyone because everybody's you know everybody's in some sort of financial position yeah whether it's uh, you know whatever job they're working out or whatever business they're trying to start up i think it's important to remember that if you frame everything your every situation you're in can be framed in a uh afterlife perspective you of know course. if you if you put in your head that whatever I'm doing now is going to have some knock-on effect on my afterlife, then it doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Uh, there is what there is, there's, there's a way you can switch that switch in your head to make it a positive experience. Yeah. You know, even yeah. if I'm suffering at work and I'm having an awful day, I would say to myself, okay, if I just, if I can keep my mouth shut yeah. <laughs> and not, and not blow off on somebody, yeah. uh, you know, then, Maybe Allah will reward me. Yeah, in, you know what I mean, and that's a test in itself. And then you know the same thing with with you know being a good business person and sticking to your contracts and sticking to your your agreements. Then you can say you know despite the fact that I'm being underhanded in this contract or despite the fact that I feel like I'm losing out, mm. if I stick to this visa um then Allah will reward me in the future. And if my rights have been um, you know breached, yeah. And, and I feel like I am being oppressed, then Allah will reward me in the future, you know? Yeah. Um, and you should be forgiving though. as well. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult though, because of course, in yeah. the moment, in the moment, you don't really think about that stuff. But it's something I'd, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm assuming maybe some people don't really think like that. And it'd be good to sort of get that injected into their system, I suppose. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say, man? Uh, yeah, that was... A, if, if you're a business owner as well, you have more responsibility than if you're an employee because you actually run the show. And so yeah. you've, you've got these opportunities to do da'wah or to make your, your finances as clean as possible, etc. Whereas when you work for others, you might not have that freedom. So, you know, I think business, that's why I would encourage Muslims in general to get into business and get into self-employment because it makes you independent of people and you know Allah loves the slave that is independent of need of people and yeah. and it's it's generally discouraged as as a muslim to be in that position where you're asking others and stuff like that um but also you're right though you're right sorry yeah. but you're right yeah like because the more i think about it and mm. it's just like every time i'm applying for a job or cuz i'm starting i'm starting a new job soon and when i think about it i'm thinking about okay i have to now think about how i'm going to navigate myself and my religion and my prayer times and my eids yeah. and my do you understand and like okay so at this point i have to ask about prayer and at this point i have to, like that is such a difficult when then you think about the history of muslims and you hit the history of business in you know maybe early early islam yeah everyone was working for themselves essentially yeah you know in terms unless they were uh, you know under the the command of someone else they had their own businesses, whether it was, you know, trade or whether it was 
sheep, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, animals and, and, and stuff like that. It was always like, okay, uh, this is why people could pray in Jama'a because everything was, sh- you know, everyone would shut their stuff and go. Yeah. And, you know, oh, it was Eid, so nothing was on, mm. you know. And it's, it's, yeah, in a Muslim country, I don't know what the difference is. That is actually another topic we could have mm. is you speaking about your experience in the UAE yeah. versus England. But the, f- the, the, the idea of the more I work, basically, the older I get and the more I work for people is the more I realize that if I just had a bit of a grasp, on my time, mm. then I could really just practice my faith a lot better. Yeah, you know, because uh, like uh, as a as we've mentioned before, as a North African with family in multiple countries, I would love to be able to just have the freedom of going and visiting them when they need to be visited, when they're sick or when they're ill. Whilst now, when you're working for someone else under set guidelines. You just think to yourself, oh, how am I going to plan in case something happens and I need to go or there's an emergency yeah. or, you know, how how many times do I have to go up to my boss and grovel just to get a heat off? Yeah. Or, do you understand? Like yeah. stuff like that is course, so, yeah. so stressful do you think, to think about. Do you think like, the, like out of a hundred Muslims, do you think, how many do you think of them are actually able to, like, I'm, of course, with hard work and a good idea and everything, are able to actually be successful in business? I don't know. Like, well, not, really not know. even I'm, Muslims, yeah, just people in general in the world. That's the thing. I, I took a stab at it. Yeah. And, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of potential there for what I've done. Yeah. But I, I'm assuming, like, circumstances really just overtook me in the sense that I got married, I had a child... And it goes back to the risk the risk thing. I couldn't afford to throw everything I had at it anymore because I've got people depending on me now much more than I did before. Of course. You know, and I'm hoping maybe in the future when things are a bit more stable and there's a bit more income coming in, then I can dabble with it again. And yeah. I think, yeah, sometimes you do have to make a choice as a father, as a husband, because when you're younger, I believe, you can take risks. You've got your family to support you, hopefully, anyway. Yeah. And, you know, if you if you stumble, you stumble and you've got a safety net. When you don't have that safety net and you people are you are other people's safety net, that is when, you know, yeah, that is tricky. when you've got, to, you've got to start actually taking a sacrifice about, oh, you know what, I'm going to have to suffer in silence for a little bit until maybe Allah increases me in a way that I can dabble a bit further and take more risks and make an investment. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. But um, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer the question. As far as if people are, if people have got them, but got it in them, I, I'd say, what is it that you consume and you're passionate about, you know? Mm. What is it that you're interested in as an individual? And like you said earlier, discovering a gap in the market. Like, I, I guess I was always fond of clothing, um, and then becoming a practicing Muslim, I didn't like I didn't like what people were producing, and I felt like the Muslim community deserved more. Yeah, and that was what kickstarted me, you know. And it wasn't necessarily about making money at the beginning; yeah. it was just about sending a message. That was you your know? why. Yeah, that was my why. Yeah. And then when I did come across people who I partnered up with who were very money motivated and very like, okay, we need to do this to make money, we need to do that to make money. There was always like friction because I just couldn't think that mm, way when someone came to me and said to me what is your goal my goal is to make six figures out of this business and to have this you know this house and this car and this is what i want i couldn't physically think of a goal like right. that because i'd never been like that before right so you as an individual who wants to start a business i believe that yeah you need to think if it's business for money which is what this you know this is mainly what this discussion has been about then yeah i think you should set goals real goals like like i want to take my parents to hajj you know mm. that that could be small but that could that could be a goal that motivates you yeah. or you yourself want to go to hajj or you want this car or you want this in the dunya or this to benefit you or you want you want to raise this much money or you want to employ to, people yeah or you want to employ anything anything that, that you can you can probably print out put it on a wall and look at it every day and motivate you that way yeah. i think that's that's very beneficial yeah um, Mohammed, I think we hit the one hour. Was it the one hour four minutes mark? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a sick, sick conversation, sick topic. I think we can do multiple parts of this. Yeah, we uh, can topic. go forever. Yeah. Um, do we have like questions to answer? See, uh, I think this week there won't be any Q and A. 
mainly yeah. because the Q and A that we do have, it's just you guys love to ask big questions, man. They love yeah. to ask big questions. I mean, yeah. they just want they want the world from us, <laughs> and we can only put, provide them inches by inches. But inshallah, guys, if you want to ask us a question, uh, the email is mindheistpodcast at gmail dot com. Uh, questions, try and keep them brief. If you want them tackled, like at the end of an episode, mm. otherwise, for something bigger, then we're going to have to like dedicate a whole episode yeah. for them. And if we and if, if we do that, then it's your answer will probably be delayed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because we've we've got uh, we've got a lot of ideas and a lot of suggestions as to topics, and we just want to really provide the best content. Like we don't really want to speak about something we don't know too much about. Like me and you, I mean, we just spoke before this episode about something we wanted to do, but neither of us really had much knowledge on it. So it'd just be a bit, <laughs> it'd be like a whole episode of silence really. <laughs> so yeah, we, we just want to be real with you guys um, and bring you the best content we can. Uh, I mean, have you got anything to close up with? Uh, just uh, remember to email us about uh, the. Remember, we said we will do a whole thing on money and finances. So let us know about that um, because, inshallah, we'll, we'll definitely do an episode on that. And then, secondly, please leave a review on this podcast. It's very easy. It probably takes I don't know one minute to two minutes to do, and it really helps in terms of the ranking and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, in terms of the review, you can just. Uh, it's a bit fiddly sometimes. All you have to do is search Mind Heist on the podcast app, and uh, there'll be like a little review section. And uh, do that for us, inshallah, and we'll keep providing you the A star quality content that you love to hear every week. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, you can follow me at Aki Tweet on all the socials. You can follow Amin on Snapchat at Sierra Masters. This has been Aki Tweet and Amin. And we will catch you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.